The Hallowed Sentinels, a beacon of hope and justice that shines brilliantly against the encroaching darkness. This holy order protected Mornstead from a fallen god's vengeance for centuries. They spilled demon blood, they manifested Aureus' divine will, and they stood dauntless beneath the banner of their illustrious Judge Cleric in defense of the five radiant beacons of their order that guard mortal realms. From such reverent heights the Sentinels have fallen, succumbed to wickedness and depravity that festers within Mornstead. Their beacons, like their souls, no longer shine pure, but flicker withered and corrupted. This is the tragic tale of the Hallowed Sentinels, and in this video we will document the Order's ancient origins, their structure and purpose, and inevitable fate. A warning that Lords of the Fallen spoilers are to come. Alright, let's dive in. By the time the Lamp Bearer sojourns to Mornstead, the Hallowed Sentinel's final chapter has already been written on bloodstained vellum. They are souls twisted, dark reflections of every virtue they once cherished. As their order patrols a kingdom sundered, they level grave judgment upon Rogar demons and hapless citizens, their eyes burnt out by the fires of hysteria and ardent zeal. In their ranks can be found no ally to the Lamp Bearer's cause. But this wasn't always the Hallowed Sentinels. Rather than reproach in blind madness, this order once carried a noble charge. To understand the essence of the Sentinels, we must travel back ages to a time when change rent the land and an immortal god was defeated by mortal hands. Adir, the ancient deity, the vile manipulator, once ruled humanity as a tyrant who stripped the people of their will and demanded supplication. Discontent fomented into outright rebellion, and behind the rallying cry of three demigods known to history as the Judges, did war against a deer and his Rogar lords, and his armies of demons and devout. Great death and desolation entered the kingdom of men, but the dauntless Judges proved mighty. They slaughtered Rogar, they pushed a deer's forces beyond the horizon and severed the demon god's connection to the mortal realm. Humankind's oppressor was vanquished. Joyous shouts rang out across the land as people embraced their freedom. But one judge, Judge Cleric, wasn't deluded. She once was Adir's priestess. She knew well his powers and felt his presence yet. Although defeated, his vile essence lingered. In the war's aftermath, Judge Cleric gathered a band of her most devoted retainers, who in reverent humility swore two solemn oaths. The first, to discard within their hearts the demon god's faith, and instead pledge religious fealty to Aureus, lord of light, heaven, and divine radiance, as their savior and deity. With his blessing, they would endeavor their second oath, to watch eternally for signs of a deer's return, to destroy his iniquitous followers and preserve the lands. Thus, the Order of the Hallowed Sentinels was established. For centuries, the Sentinels followed their radiant Judge Cleric into darkness and banished it with Aureus' light, their devotion and renown growing with each successive generation. But soon, the greatest threat to the Eternal Watch confronted Cleric and her retinue. The hubris of mankind weakened the veil that separated realities, and Adir stirred in his exile. He sent forth his most capable Rogar lords at the head of countless demonic legions to orchestrate a sinister return. The events of the original Lords of the Fallen game transpire, which see the prisoner-turned-hero Harkin thwart Adir's uprising. Surrounding this narrative, the Hallowed Sentinels wage bloody war on their ancient enemies and experience firsthand the barbaric depravity documented in the Order's histories. Dust settles. The conflict sees humanity reaffirm its lordship, but for Cleric and the Sentinels, it marks an almost cataclysmic failure of their duty, one that must be rectified. The Order sojourns to the palm of a deer a monument within the Hand of God mountains that is locus of the demon god's malignant aura. Beneath its craggy silhouette, the young kingdom of Mornstead toils. To contain Adir's lingering miasma, 
Judge Cleric leads the Sentinels in austere ritual at five locations. Holy pillars suffused with Orion Radiance are erected that bind tightly the demon god's shackles. Thus the beacons of the Sentinels gleam towards the heavens and the Order invests itself within Mornstead. Their new charge? To protect and maintain the Radiant Beacons and preserve peace across mankind. The intervening millennia molds the Order into much of what they are today, enforced by foundational beliefs that act as pillars of their existence and guided in action by the light of their heaven's ordained purpose. Such beliefs are manifest in the various structures housed within the hallowed Sentinel's fortress complex, carved out of Mornstead's cliff face. The first is religion, espoused from the Empyrean's tall spires and echoing within the corridors of the Abbey of the Hallowed Sisters. These buildings stand as physical symbols of the Sentinel's indomitable faith, a faith that burns in every soul. Many are the prayers whispered and hymns sung, extolling Divine Aureus and the valiant acts of Judge Cleric. Core to the Hallowed Sentinel's ideals are those professed by the Church of Orion Radiance. Religion grounds the Sentinels. It rejuvenates souls worn by their eternal duty, shepherds moral principles, and arms the Order against threats physical and intangible. Many branches of Orism have existed throughout the centuries. The sect practiced by the Sentinels is one conservative and inflexible, pious beyond others perhaps due to their continued and common conflict with a host of demonic forces. The intolerance of the Sentinels is first displayed on their arrival in Mornstead, in competition with the established orism as the hidden lore of the Skyrest Bridge Key reveals. The Descriers of the Dawn were Mornstead's preeminent religious institution for centuries, but in all their intense studying of sunrises, sunsets, and stars, none among them foresaw the grim future which the coming of the hallowed sentinels would bring about. Here, they persecute the descriers of the dawn, defacing their superstitious beliefs and taking by force their old places of worship. And any descrier of the dawn found trespassing will be severely punished for their transgression. This place is now sanctified in the name of Judge Cleric, and no longer a sanctuary for the ignorant and misguided. Please. This has been our home for generations. We've always kept our hearts open to the old Sentinels. Be grateful that by Judge Cleric's mercy, you are allowed to leave with those wayward hearts still beating. Repent, and turn to her for salvation. Orism arms the Sentinels with radiant magic, the blessing of God himself, used to heal body and spirit, as well as seer heresy rampant in the world. The second virtue of the Sentinels is charity. Their holy charge engenders within them an ally to the plight of all humankind, and the Order is quick to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, and protect the meek. Infirmaries, orphanages, and sanatorium stand in Mornstead's towns and stud the highways that wind throughout the greater Oathlands. Selflessness is the essence of many radiant sorceries used to heal the injured, cure disease, and bestow Aureus welcome respite. Casters within the Sentinels weave sigils of the church and suffuse the ground with wellsprings of warming light, which is displayed in spells such as Healing Sigil and Consecrate. As the Codex of Eternal Radiance states, Any and all afflictions shall be washed away by Aureus divine light, the flesh reborn, the spirit renewed. The Mans of the Hallowed Brothers contains a plague hospital and ward where afflicted sentinels and laypeople would receive blessed medicaments and hospice. Remnants of the extent of Adir's Rogar corruption can still be seen while endeavoring the dilapidated structure. The third virtue embraced by the hallowed sentinels is penance. The holy sacrament of self-mortification allows members of the order to redress themselves internal turmoil viewed as sin within their religion. Only penitent souls humbled by Aureus divinity are accepted into his loving embrace. 
This is exemplified by the hallowed sentinel's use of blood when invoking radiant magic. Blood is symbolic of pain and self-inflicted suffering to achieve spiritual clarity, to receive heavenly blessing. We're enlightened to these practices in the lore of the castigated armor taint. In many branches of orism, those followers who fall short of expectations are required to perform penance, relinquishing their pride and any elaborate or colorful garb before striving for forgiveness through righteous mortification. While that of the martyr details the fascination with the crimson bodily humor, sanguine tabards and robes can signify a righteous willingness to shed heretical blood, while also serving as a reminder of one's own blood, whether spilled willingly by one's own hand in Aureus' name, or by the blade of an impious adversary. Many within the order flagellate themselves or don barbed armors as a form of expiating sin. The domineering tower of penance acts as locus of pain within the sentinel's order. Wayward souls deemed blasphemous are sent in shackles to the tower. Within, a nightmare of tortures and castigations await. The tower echoes with agonized wails and the dripping of blood released by those who fall into practices not tolerated by the dogmatic sentinels. Tancred, lord of the tower, sits as master of castigations. These three virtues, faith, charity, penance, interweave to support one another and bolster the sentinel's purpose, to maintain the holy beacons whose radiant magic bars a deer's return from exile, and to ruthlessly persecute any who count among the demon god's retinue. To execute their task, the order follows a strict hierarchy through which rules are divided. Judge Cleric, the Immaculate Lady, oversees all sentinel activity from her bastion church of the Empyrean. To her, all sentinels bow in deference. The ancient founder embodies all that the order stands for, and her untarnished perfection is exemplar to which all strive. Cleric personally defends one of the five sentinel beacons. Her deeds through the ages have elevated her to a saintliness in league with Aureus' own. The austere halls of the Empyrean are a testament to the sentinel centuries protecting humankind. Altars and shrines exalt Judge Cleric, while massive tapestries cascade down walls, detailing the Order's most noble moments. These sanctified chambers are guarded by the unmoving silhouettes of abiding defenders. This cast of warriors is occupied by the most devout and dauntless hallowed sisters who have ever served Judge Cleric and they continue to prove worth beyond the grave. The defenders are the corpses of fallen sentinels interred in great armor and imbued with mystical animation. Only the most honored of holy sisters are chosen to occupy the armor of an abiding defender after death so that they may continue serving the cleric even from beyond the grave, their corpses well preserved and impelled by powerful radiant sorcery. They are the cleric's personal guard, seen attached to her in countless stigmas. Though their existence goes against the natural order, and despite possessing no will of their own, the abiding defenders are revered among the hallowed sentinels, due to both the identities of the corpses occupying the armors and the armor design itself, identical suits having been worn by some of the very first sentinels. These sisters work in tandem pairs raining down relentless sword strikes and holy magic. So long as one of the pair remains, they can resurrect their fallen partner. It would seem that the Ebonlight defenders have drawn on umbral power to invest chilling frost upon their blades. The Luminous sisters, in contrast, charge theirs with Aureus light. Stalking the Empyrean's shadows can be found a band of assassins that stand as clerics hidden defenders guardians of the Immaculate Lady's Sanctum. The sanctified huntresses are masters of stealth. Cunning and lithe, they wield shield and spear to dispense cleric's justice. A sanctified huntress is also an adept in offensive radiant sorceries and calls forth aureus lightning. So great in cloak and dagger are they that when the precise elimination of an obstructive individual was deemed necessary by Judge Cleric, the task was typically assigned 
to a sanctified huntress. Beneath the Empyrean both physically and hierarchically sits the Abbey of the Hallowed Sisters, where women of the order train for their holy charge. The great rectresses of the sisters are the abbesses who administer. Only the Immaculate Lady herself is of higher standing. As the hidden lore of the abbess mitre records, abbesses are second only to the cleric herself in the hierarchy of the hallowed sentinels, being so utterly dedicated to their mastery of radiant magic that they allow their bodies to atrophy through neglect. And indeed their figures are greatly emaciated, the devastating sorcery unleashed indicative of their devotion. These sisters wear ornate robes adorned with candles to remind of their enlightenment, their eternal vigil, and as guides to navigate a world dark with heresy. The abbesses carry with them barbed chalices flowing with the sanguine humor. These consecrated reservoirs of blood are ready to be used in the casting of whatever radiant sorcery they deem fit, the vessels having become increasingly ornate over time. An abbess is a font of radiant magic to rejuvenate her fellow sentinels. Other sisters that patrol the grounds include the order of dead-shot archers known as the Sin Piercers. These sisters are marksmen deadly with bow and arrow. They loose missiles to strike demons and transgressors from great distance. They are also complete in their dedication to Judge Cleric, swearing exalted oaths of silence to deepen their bond to their leader, as the hidden lore of the Sin Piercer set suggests. Some take this further sewing shut their own mouths in cleansing self-mortification. The Sin Piercers are often accompanied by savage, armored warhounds. Also within the Abbey are fanatic zealots known as Scourged Sisters. These sentinels revere blood and bloodletting as the most sanctified religious practice. They engage in the regular letting and consumption of their own blood believing that only by exposing it to the divine light of the cleric before taking it back into their bodies can it be properly sanctified. It is a ritual without end. If we scrutinize them closely, we see the sisters wrapped in blood-stained gauze, inscribed with holy prayers in scripture meant to evoke profound faith. They consider pain to be a vital connection to the world and thus the cleric's divinity. With flails and thorned magic, they happily liberate blood from the bodies of the Order's enemies. The Hallowed Sentinel Brothers reside and train within the manse across from the Abbey. The most revered and adept brothers are among the ranks of the Crimson Rectors. The Masked Knights have achieved the highest honors. They are inimitable swordsmen and channel Aureus divine magic to vanquish foes. The duties of the Crimson Rectors include presiding over various religious services and governing those of lower rank, the Rectors keeping a stern watch over their comrades so that any who shirk or stray are properly reprimanded. They police internally with a ruthless conviction. Many enjoy the authority of their position as they admonish wayward siblings. The pleasure they derive and their brutality in the lore of Crimson Rector sword. Many bloody and cowed hallowed sentinels have looked up into the face of a looming crimson rector, hoping to glimpse some trace of clemency there, only to find nothing but an unmoved metal mask staring back at them. Beneath the rectors stand the resolute Holy Bulwarks, a fitting name for a class of warrior that relies on brute strength to bring divine judgment and behind whose unbreakable armor ranks of sentinels gather. The bulwarks receive divine blessing from Cleric and Aureus. They are an inextinguishable light to rally against darkness. Proving oneself worthy of the rank of Holy Bulwark demands tremendous physical strength and endurance, and those who succeed take great pride in not only staunchly defending their order and its beliefs, but also ruthlessly crushing heresy wherever it may be found. The Pure Blades represent the bulk of Hallowed Sentinel knightly power. 
These holy brothers have proven both their dedication to Aureus and dedication to the Sentinel's cause through the crucible of deathly combat. These knights are relentless and can channel briefly powerful radiant magic. Only true believers in the Sentinels achieve the honor of Pure Blade, and on the day that a believer is inducted into the ranks of the Pure Blade Knights, they gladly cut into their own flesh and dab their uniform with a holy cross of their own blood as a testament to their conviction and to ward off sin. The largest contingent of sentinels exists in the ranks of avowed soldiers and marksmen. The avowed are laymen who have yet to prove themselves worthy of distinction within the order, but who have been inducted and allowed to bear the sentinel cross. These soldiers have successfully completed arduous pilgrimages to Mornstead and survived dauntless trials. Their heroism and faith is unfortunately ill-regarded, as the avowed armor hints at what this level of warrior can expect. A low-ranking hallowed sentinel who has earned the privilege of dying for the glory of the cleric, if little else. A constant stream of manpower flows into the order in the form of penitent and dedicated pilgrims, used to replace fallen comrades. For generations, countless pilgrims have been making the often long and arduous journey to Mornstead with the goal of joining the hallowed sentinels and serving the cleric, assured that their faith and dedication will be recognized. These souls sojourn from myriad lands and for disparate reasons, but with the shared goal of leaving their old lives behind and being baptized anew in the light of Judge Cleric. Mornstead is a fickle land, however, fraught with danger and death. This is only furthered when the luminous Judge Cleric and her hallowed sentinels fall beneath the thrall of a malevolent force from their past that strikes their very souls and threatens their eternal watch. What transpires when virtues without moderation become vices? Righteousness without temperance falls to persecution. Penance without mercy leads to slaughter. Conviction without charity becomes desolation. This is the ultimate fate of the hallowed sentinels, who along with their immaculate lady judge cleric, are consumed by horrifying corruption and transformation that over centuries insidiously eats away their virtue. The source of the order's fall to perfidy dwells within the rune of Adir, an artifact born of the demon god himself and imbued with his malevolent aura. Long ago, Harkin handed the rune to Judge Cleric in hopes she would either destroy or bind it, and it has been in the custody of the Sentinels since. Its arrival in Mornstead, however, seals their doom. The rune pulses with unholy Rogar energies. It is symbolic of power, temptation, manipulation. The rune invades minds, withers bodies in an irresistible corruption that twists souls to a deer's will. The fall of the Sentinels is mirrored and preceded by the weakening of their holy beacons. The rune's presence undermines the radiant magic sustaining the five beacons of the Sentinels and threatens Adir's resurrection. Sacrifice, great sacrifice, is required on behalf of the Sentinels to preserve the prison and ensure their duty remains fulfilled. But the knowledge that the beacons aren't incorruptible sends panicked shockwaves rippling through the Order's ranks and marks a grave turning point that will in generations see the sentinel's purity stained, their duty warped as they slowly become what they most despise. The collapse of the hallowed sentinels is well documented and preserved in histories, texts, artifacts, and memories all dispersed across Mornstead. First, the Order is gripped with an unshakable paranoia that breeds ruthlessness and barbarity. The Sentinels fixate on sin and its purging. They see blasphemy everywhere and work with great industry to extricate it. Pilgrims who've traveled by the thousands to seek Judge Cleric are shunned. They are denied rights and decency, strung up, tortured and mutilated by roving bands of deranged Sentinels intent on purging them of their transgressions. Oh, hallowed sentinels. 
most blessed representatives of the Holy Church Cleric. My soul soars to see... Hold your tongue, pilgrim. And on your feet. You are on sacred ground. And we are yet to see whether you are deserving of that honor. I assure you. I have dedicated my life to the teachings of Judge Cleric. My faith in her and her divine works is boundless. Pray it is. For our Immaculate Lady's light will lay bare the truth. And in radiance, there is judgment. This descent into radical fanaticism, detailed in the lore of the hallowed sentinel scripture, which exists as one of the Order's most revered texts. Many are the lessons and tales inscribed in the pages of the numerous hallowed sentinel texts, written over the centuries, from the more tolerant and benevolent earlier works to the harsher, more fanatical writings of later years. The Order launches inquisitions to root out heretical adir worship that has gained purchase within Mornstead and decimate sympathizers both guilty and imagined among the kingdom's population. Even within the Order are brothers and sisters suspected. Those who do not unequivocally extol their faith are loosed upon by zealous censors. The grim methods of castigation and sentinel debauchery on display in this stigma, located in the Manse of Hallowed Brothers, where a crimson rector administers punishment. Forgive me, this... Is this not overly severe for the offense in question? To my ears, my fellow pilgrims' words were innocuous. Are you refusing a hallowed sentinel's command? Because you will find the punishment for such is far more severe than mere flogging. No, rector. I apologize. Soon, the Tower of Penance overflows with impure masses, nightmarish torture unleashed upon them by sentinels who have succumbed to hysteria and madness. Their censorship is passed down in the hidden lore of heretical sentinel's hammer, which details one disillusioned with her religion. As the hallowed sentinels fell further into cruelty and zealotry, one disenchanted member of the order found herself turning to a different faith originating in Uderanger, but when her secret studies and crafted objects were discovered, she was judged a heretic and executed. And in the shield of piercing light, we see that once venerated figures have their names and memories struck from the histories if they do not align with the new sentinel dogma. Originating from this paranoia is adoption of an extremely severe view on sin and atonement. The Sentinels had always seen sacrifice as holy and integral to their order, but Adir's influence perverts it to the extreme. A macabre fascination with blood and bloodletting permeates the order. The allure of heresy abounds. Only through self-harm can a Sentinel cleanse their inherent evil. Brothers and sisters begin adorning armor with barbs, spikes, and thorns to inflict pain. These are symbolic of the suffering endured to achieve purity and of the insanity plaguing the order. The antique hallowed sentinel armor gives insight as it juxtaposes the sentinel's old roots with its current form. The lack of wicked thorns or filthy bloodstains or any other grim elements stands as evidence of this armor being from a more righteous time in the hallowed sentinel's distant past. The scourged sisters highlight the length gone to ensure devotion and pious resolve. We see them coated in dried blood and wearing armor fashioned to self-mutilation. The hidden lore states, The scourged sisters are ruthless self-flagellators and self-lacerators who wrap themselves in prayer-inscribed bandages and lengths of pliable, thorned metal with equal enthusiasm. Perhaps the most apparent and brutish examples of self-flagellation are in the ardent penitents who wear spiked iron head cages and shackles to pierce their own skin, and who flay their own backs in an attempt to destroy sin and reach holiness. Not all of those who are sentenced to do penance 
can endure what follows, while others withstand their cleansing gladly, their zeal maintaining them throughout their suffering. Across the order, an aesthetic change is seen that signifies their austere and imperious practices, as no piece of armor, no weapon, is left unstained by blood or unmarked by thorns. An echo of their precipitous fall to malfeasance. This fascination with blood isn't limited to self-harm. The hallowed sentinels perform brutal atrocities. In their wake, blood of sinners inundates city streets. We see the cruelty in their methods by scrutinizing their weapons. Blades like the hallowed praise and blood letter show weapons wreathed in barbs and thorns to better rend flesh and liberate blood. The praise's hidden lore details the sentinel's blindness to their own transgressions. For a long time, the hallowed sentinels have been quick to see sin all around them, only to remain blind to the corruption within themselves, even when the source of that corruption is the very thing that they were formed to stand against. Mechanically, too, many of the sentinels' weapons inflict bleed buildup, such as the thorned crimson rector sword and bloody glory. The cruelty thus embraced has unleashed a sanguine flood that washes sin and purifies Mornstead's heretical soul, the horrors of which are heard in this stigma. King Brabis, the hallowed sentinels must be stopped. We cannot tolerate this any longer. The barbarism they displayed yesterday was only the latest in a long line of offenses. But we all know there will be many more and greater crimes to come. Surely, Mornstead has suffered long enough in their shadow. The fate of Mornstead and every single soul within it is mine to decide. Fate in my hands. You. Third in the Sentinel's perversion is the rise of a radical branch of Orism in which the Order worships Judge Cleric as a god, a messianic figure who will lead the Sentinels to paradise. This focus on the sanctity of Cleric over Aureus leads to a schism wherein the Sentinels denounce the Church of Orion Radiance, heard in the hidden lore of Cleric's benediction. Once, Judge Cleric and the Church of Orion Radiance worked side by side, but over time a rift formed between them until eventually Judge Cleric cut ties with the Church. A deer's influence breeds a harsh and inflexible religion built upon ruthless censorship and blind obedience to the Immaculate Lady. Her will is final, her command obeyed. She is the highest justiciar, which we hear in the Sentinel's newly adopted creed. In radiance, judgment. The establishment of a new religion sees concurrent development of new radiant sorceries. Motifs of briars, thorns, and blood are shared across this new wave of magical incantations, a symbolic embodiment of the hallowed sentinels' continued corruption. Over the centuries, the hallowed sentinels have developed a number of their own unique radiant sorceries, once gladly shared with others, but now selfishly kept from all those deemed unworthy. Spells such as the lacerating weapon, the briar storm, and the barbed aura place great emphasis on the bloodletting deemed paramount by these now twisted sentinels, and we see the garments of the abbesses, the most skilled casters, likewise stained crimson. The split between the Church of Orion Radiance and Judge Cleric's ardent fanatics echoed in the hidden lore of the bloody Aspergillum. Over time, the teachings of Judge Cleric gradually placed an even greater emphasis on the importance of blood and its connection to radiant magic than the Church of Orion Radiance ever had. The hallowed sentinels have become a base and callous husk of all they once stood for. Hysteria and malfeasance have blinded them to their own heresy and weakened them against their ancient enemy. The Order, who have for millennia stood vigil as holy paragons and custodians of the demon god, are now fallen in wickedness. They are dealt a mortal blow with the complete corruption of the five beacons they defend. The radiant magic pulsing from their fonts is now tinged Rogar red. A deer's rune unleashes unremitting waves of demonic energies that lead to plague, 
physical derangement, and insanity. Horrors beyond imagining greet the lamp air within bloodstained corridors of the abbey. Here, a deer's rune has festered. Here, untold atrocity has been committed. The gore dripping from the abbey's once consecrated chamber is symbolic of the order's irredeemable descent into wickedness. They slaughter with sadistic glee any bearing Rogar corruption in a vain attempt to mitigate the virulent plague. But as the hidden lore of the corrupted pilgrim armor relates, the strength of a pilgrim's faith has no bearing on which of them will fall prey to the Rogar corruption that plagues Mornstead, and no amount of prayer or radiant magic can heal the ravaging malady once a victim is infected. The hallowed sentinels and Judge Cleric are now twisted beyond redemption. They fight as they always have against the deer, but their methods are unjust. They've become monsters blind with fear. All of Mornstead buckles as the sentinels declare war on any not among their own. It's here, in the dark abyss of iniquity, that the banner of the hallowed sentinels has fallen in tatters. An order that once stood as a brilliant beacon of virtue, a light in the shadow, is now extinguished. It is a hollow, depraved reflection of itself, deplorable and worthy only of condemnation. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the Hallowed Sentinel Order in Lords of the Fallen. Let me know your thoughts on the Sentinel's mission, their gallant knights, and their fall from grace, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of Lauren's storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash thelorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.